Welcome to Behold Bible Study. This is the uh, 11th Sunday of Pentecost coming up, August 16th. Um, and we will begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks as we enter into your word once again, that you inspire us to not just uh, sit by passively, but be moved, be empowered by your spirit, by your coming, to do your will in this place. Let your word inspire us to be your people here and now, and proclaim your greatness in a world in need. In your holy name we pray, amen. So this uh, Sunday, uh, the August 16th, we actually have a guest preacher, uh, Margie Olson, who is a member of our congregation, uh, will be preaching. And uh, whereas we, she would have been preaching on the text assigned for the 11th uh, Sunday after Pentecost, actually she uh, requested to preach on the text that are assigned for August 15th, which is a saint day, it's St. Mary, Mother of Our Lord, Sunday, or St. Mother of Our Mary, Lord, uh, day on the 15th of August. And the text that is assigned for that day is Luke 1, 46 through 55, which is Mary's prayer, or the Magnificat. So, um, just a little foretaste. So, uh, a guest preacher. Margie Olson uh, has been a member of our congregation, and this week marks the 25th uh, anniversary of her ordination. You may not know that she's uh, an ordained minister in the ELCA, um, but she is. This is also the, this year, 2020, is the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women in the church. It's only been 50 years that they've been allowed to be uh, pastors, and Margie is proud and um, of that, and we wanted to invite her to preach and share a word of proclamation on this day. So she has chosen this text, Luke 1, 46, as Mary's text. I'll read it to you as follows. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowly of his servant. Surely from now on generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength from his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from the thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Here ends the reading. So the Magnificat, you know, Mary's prayer when she found out that she was pregnant. This is the text from Luke 1, 46. Uh, Latin, uh, Magnificat is Latin for to magnify. You know, Mary here magnifies the Lord uh, in proclaiming the Lord's greatness and rejoicing in God's, uh, sa that God as Savior uh, Mary begins her kind of narrative with God's actions in her own life, starting out uh, for choosing her to be the Messiah's mother. The Mighty One indeed has done great things for her. Uh, Elizabeth, her uh, cousin, has just welcomed her in honor in the text previously, saying, Blessed is she who believed. And now she recognizes with awe not only what Elizabeth but also all the generations uh, before her and that will come after will call her blessed. So consider blessed. What is blessed? You know, even uh, in our modern day, hashtag blessed um, is thought to be in termed as meaning that you're living the good life, uh, a life of privilege and comfort. And, and that is how our world would depict it. But Mary in her state, in her day and age, was anything but blessed. Mary was a nobody. She was actually even disgraced in her community because she was unmarried and pregnant. She was going to bear a child that was going to cause great grief to her, uh, as Simeon uh, was going to foretell. Even uh, there will be many that will rise and fall at, at the coming of this child, and your own soul will be pierced as well. She was going to have to face her son being rejected, shamed, and crucified. Uh, despite all this, 
Mary still calls and praises God for honoring her. I want you to think for a minute um, a little bit about the image you might have of Mary as a young woman. Think Christmas time and manger scenes or pictures or stories or depictions on Christmas Eve. What uh, you imagine of Mary. You might think of this meek and mild young woman, a timid girl, shy, subservient. Uh, when the angels told her that she was going to be pregnant, she said, your will be done um, and magnifies God. And yet, the song she sings, you know, that's the image we have of Mary, of Christmas and this beautiful young family starting out. But the Magnificat, the, the, uh, that she proclaimed when she found out that she was going to carry the Messiah, the Savior of the world, was one of the most radical protest songs ever, to this day. It still is. It's a kind of song that the Israelites actually have, uh, have been singing for generations, whether they were in Egypt or the lips of them when they were in exile in Babylon. They're the kinds of songs that countless of Hebrews sang throughout the ages in defiance when they were uh, sent uh, away from their lands, when they were overrun in defiance of uh, when they were enslaved or when their kings uh, belittled them, when invaders came. And Mary's song was no different than these. Think actually not of a meek and mild, but you should think of Mary as a radical protest street marcher uh, in this. Here again, the words from Mary. The Lord has shown strength in his arm, has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, has brought down the powerful from their thrones, has lifted the lowly, has lifted the hungry with good things, and sent the rich away empty. That comes from Luke 1, verse 51 through 53. Mary's psalm, um, as it is sometimes known as, uh, sounded that initial clear trumpet of what uh, Christ's coming in Christmas would be. Advent, if you remember, Advent, we often get texts in Advent about the end of the cosmos, the end of, the, of, of turmoil. Um, you know, a light shines in the darkness. You have these doom, these doom and gloom texts. And this text often shows up, you know, the fourth Sunday of Advent, uh, right before Christmas, when everybody's thinking of peace and goodwill to all men and women. And, and on the St. Mary, uh, the day of uh, St. Mary, of Mother of Our Lord Day, we remember that this was actually a radical protest song of the world's image and how God's rule was going to come against what the real world thought. You know, for those who are poor, they might think, you know, why are we poor? Is this deemed? Did God want this to be? Is this just the way things are? Was it divine right? Did I do something bad in a previous life and um, I, sh I should change my ways so that I might, you know, have better karma next time? Or is it just we're not smart enough? So, you know what? That, that's our own fault for being this way. Mary's proclamation and her psalm uh, say, no, Christ has come to challenge all these structures of sin and death and the devil and all oppression. Christ came in the strength of the Lord to do what the Lord has always done. You know, all, <laughs> think about the Christian message. Christ came to lift up the lowly, to free the enslaved, to feed the hungry, to give justice to the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner. Think about the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, you know, great preaching proclamation to the masses. You know, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not the ones who've stocked away their 401k, or not the ones who've gained political power and influence in the world. Um, Mary's song, or psalm, was meant to be a song of resistance. Um, and it wasn't new at all to the Hebrew or the Jewish tradition. It was a song in harmony with many other songs uh, before it. She actually was picking up uh, the tone of what was a protest song of the Israelites for years before. It's the same as what Moses and Miriam sang um, in resistance 
to Pharaoh and asking for God's deliverance from the oppression of the house of Pharaoh. It was um, the same protest song that Hannah, um, who was afflicted without children, sang in resistance to deliverance of those who were oppressing her because she hadn't uh, born an heir. It was uh, the same protest song that uh, Psalm 146, uh, the Lord sets prisoners free, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, and the Lord loves the righteous. Throughout the ages, God's people have faced oppression. And in the face of that oppression, God's people have sung songs of resistance, songs like Mary's Magnificat. Um, but God's people have also themselves been oppressors. We have enslaved others and each other. We have stolen from and oppressed others and each other. We have also, um, and when we've done so, the oppressed have sung songs of resistance against us. Advent, you know, if you think about the time of Advent and Christmas, it's a time for singing. Um, some of the most familiar hymns uh, and songs are things that uh, we naturally would sing. And the Magnificat is probably one of the most well-known songs in this time of Advent. But I bet when you think of the Magnificat, you think of maybe Lent and Holden Evening Prayer. Uh, where Marty Haugen wrote uh, in Holden Evening Prayer, the Magnificat, My soul proclaims your greatness, O God. It's a very melodic, mellow, and peaceful, but there's many other Magnificats that were written, uh, some inner hymnal, that are more militant, much more uh, in-your-face songs of protest. Um, Hark the Glad Sound is another hymn. It came upon a midnight clear, uh, you know, talks about beneath life's crushing load, God will deliver us. O come, O come, Emmanuel is a protest song. You know, it, we should think about how we have turned a deaf ear to Mary's radicalism in her own song, in her resistance. And we think of Christmas as a cattle lowing and crying, no crying did Jesus make, when actually Mary was the one who was going to raise him to fight against the injustices of the world and point this out. Christ came to stand against sin and death and the power of the devil. And this text depicts it all for us. So think about this. Our preconceived images of Mary and who that was. And our guest preacher for this Sunday, Margie Olson. I don't know if you've met Margie or you know Margie. But uh, Margie is turning 90 this year. So she's in one of our elders. Margie is a mother. She's a grandmother. She is a knitter. She's one of our quilters. She's one of the most peaceful people and prayerful people that you would think of. But Margie is also a powerful protest preacher. She's a radical theologian. She's served immigrant churches in the inner city. She's constantly written letters to legislators and she's a political activist. She's been denied a role in the church when she was first coming out of college, um, when she wanted to go into ministry, but women were not allowed. So she went and s served a full career as a nurse, uh, working in healthcare. And then as a second career, once women were allowed to be ordained, she went back to seminary after she had retired from uh, 30 years of nursing. And she got, she was ordained when she was 65 years old and then began to preach and served for 25 years. So, whereas you might think of a meek and mild uh, message, when you tune in this Sunday, I might warn you to be prepared because Mary's radicalism just might show up again. Let's close with a prayer. We thank you, God, for all the women of faith who have continued to carry your banner of peace and justice and reconciliation. Bless us that we might hear and listen to your word from the mother of the one who gave birth to a world ready to be changed. In your holy name we pray. Amen.